Hi friends, we're going to do three things in this video. We're going to talk about this camera, what it is. We're also going to talk about the story behind this camera, where it's from, and then we're going to use it. We're going to go out, actually take some photos, and I'll show you those here. So what is this camera? This camera was made in 1948, and it was made in occupied Japan. Now, this is the Konica 1. There was a couple of different iterations within that. I believe this is the Konica 1B, at least from the best I can tell from the markings and what I've read online. And coming out of World War II, pretty much every company in Japan was making some version of a camera. There was a lot of experimenting happening and a lot of just what I would describe as innovation, trial and error, and trying to figure out what does it mean to have a pocketable-ish camera. And so this is a 35 millimeter film camera that is rangefinder and was just kind of pretty cool in my opinion. Now, today's standards, this is an odd camera to use because walk you through just a couple of features here of how to take one photo. So obviously let's pretend you've already loaded the film. To get started, you have to pop the lens out, lock that into place, and now your, obviously your ISO is gonna be based off the film you have. Your shutter speed is here on the outer ring of your lens. So let's just go ahead, pretend it'll set that to 100. On the side here, you have another lever that sets your aperture. And then you have this lever back here that adjusts your focus. So as you're looking through, it is range finder. So you have to make sure and line up those two images to make sure it's in focus. And then you cock the shutter and then you, that's your actual like taking the photo shutter button. So you have two different levers you have to use. Now to advance the film, you have a button back here that you have to press to release and then you spin the dial over here to advance the film and you start the process over. So not the fastest thing in the world. The lens on here is a 50 millimeter lens. It has an aperture, max aperture of 3.5. And so you're not getting any crazy shallow depth of field. This is a, a camera from the late forties, remember that. And it does say made in Occupy Japan. So again, timing of what this, this camera was made in. And what's cool is this camera didn't just come like this. It also came with a big leather case. Let me grab that. So this case, you slide the camera down in here. It does spin, screw in to lock it in there. And you can do everything you need. Take the photos right here and then flip that up. It snaps shut and now you have it in a carrying case. This did have a strap with it that has since broken again, 1948 been a while uh, but that is this camera now where did this come from because that to me is the most important part about a year ago coming up on a year ago my wife's grandfather passed away and like many there's usually a film camera tucked away somewhere and that's exactly what happened we found this camera tucked away in a drawer in kind of a cabinet space in his office uh, after he had passed away. So I did not know that this camera existed, otherwise I would have loved to sit down and talk with him and ask him questions about it because he served in the military uh, as part of the Korean War and that means he was overseas. He was in Korea, I believe, or Japan. I actually don't know the details of his service, but he was overseas and I believe that's where he picked up this camera. Um, just based off the fact that it says made in Occupy Japan and the timing of when this was made and knowing that he was overseas during that time, I believe he picked this camera up while he was serving. And I would love to know the history of that and what photos he was able to make with this overseas as well as when he brought it back home and, and growing up here in the western suburbs of Chicago and uh, raising family and all of those things. Uh, this has probably seen a lot. This, this camera has made a lot of photos and there's some that I've seen and uh, there's a classic one of his dad that uh, sitting out in the yard that I, I wish I could share, um, but I don't have that uh, now that he has passed. But that means that this camera is special, right? 
it does work. It takes photos. It's not the best, it's not the sharpest. It's not gonna be anything amazing. This isn't valued at all that much. I found it for literally $40 on eBay. So there's not a whole lot of value, except the sentimental value, kind of the family connection. And while he was not my own grandfather, uh, it was my wife's grandfather. I did get to spend a lot of time with him and taking him to lunch and hearing his stories and uh, driving around the city that he grew up in and him just pointing out his childhood home and his elementary school and where he worked at the bowling alley and selling pop on the corner. Uh, all of those classic stories uh, is something that uh, I cherished and something that I appreciated about our time together with him. And so for me to be able to now own this camera to be able to make some photos with it uh, is special. And so I know that it works because I've put some expired film through it just to see, is it, does it actually function? Uh, does it take photos that are in focus? Uh, what, how does all of that work? So I've done that. Uh, not something I'm gonna rely on uh, 100%, but it is something that, you know, doing more casual work, just walk around photography, this is something that I can use and something that I can continue that heritage of uh, him using this camera that I can now use it in my day-to-day -day life. So why don't we do that? I'm going to, I'm gonna put some relatively cheap film, some Fujifilm 200. This is a color film. I'm gonna throw this roll in here and we'll go out and take some photos.